Hello and good morning. Welcome back to another edition of Sunday Focus. You know, many organizations across the Sioux Empire help those in need, but Call to Freedom takes this acts of service to the next level. Call to Freedom is at the forefront of helping victims of sex and labor trafficking navigate a new path. It's not an easy journey, but the hope is through education, others can help those who are being trafficked in our area and state. CEO and founder of Call to Freedom, Becky Rasmussen, joins us in the studio to tell us more about the organization and how others can get involved. Good morning, Becky. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Christine. Of course. We're glad to have you, to welcome you on the show. And we are going to be talking about some serious topics. It's not going to be a light fluffy, this is what's going on in the Sioux Empire type of show. These conversations will be heavy. And in order to get an idea of what we're going to be talking about, I want to know a little bit about you, Becky, and your role with Call of the Freedom. So let's start off with that. You know, I have a great team of 27 staff that are at Call to Freedom. And so I like to say we. Um, I did establish Call to Freedom in 2016, and it's been a journey. Um, for me, it's a call. I feel like I was called to help individuals out of human trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation. And so what we do there at Call to Freedom is we're a, a trauma-informed nonprofit that provides supportive, ongoing, coordinated services for all individuals that impact by human trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation. And never did I think that the need would be so great mm -hmm. when I started Call to Freedom. And since we have progressed, uh, it was actually November of 2017 that we became two full-time employees. Um, fast forward today, like I said, 27 staff who are compassionate, caring individuals that provide services. But we have two office spaces here in South Dakota. Uh, we have a home that houses women with their children that have been suffered from, from trafficking situations. And we continue to provide education, um, support state legislation, and, and share our voice on that level as well, um, but also to do prevention and intervention. Um, and we have trainers that go across the state. To date, we've served over 1,300 individuals that have walked through the doors of Call to Freedom. Mm -hmm. And we also are seeing last year, we had 417 individuals that we served through our programs. And we trained over 10,000 people on how to identify and respond to human trafficking. So we're not slowing down <laughs> um, and we actually work somewhat on a, a national level as well, where we've received calls from every state but 16 in the United States since we've opened for services for victims of trafficking. I'm sure for anyone listening who might be new to the Sioux Empire or probably wondering, OK, call the freedom. We've heard about it a couple of times here and there, but this is a South Dakota organization, right? Yeah, we were founded in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, you might have heard about us in Utah, or you might have heard about us in Michigan, because we've navigated cases from all the United States. But our primary right now, even with Marissa's House, which is a home that provides uh, supportive services to women and children that are victimized by, by trafficking, we've only accepted one out-of-state referral. And so all of our referrals um, since opening the house in 2016 have come from South Dakota. So a lot of people say there isn't a human and trafficking problem, you know, commercial sexual exploitation mm -hmm. is not happening. And that simply is not the case. And so Call to Freedom is here to do a couple things. So we're here to provide services first and foremost to those that have uh, experienced human trafficking. But also we've served parents who are navigating a case where they are seeing their children being groomed by some stranger that they've never met. And they're starting to see those red flags that look like a potential trafficking recruitment situation, mm -hmm. which we call grooming. We've intervened on cases with that and we've trained thousands of first responders across the state of South Dakota to better identify victims of human trafficking. And we also do prevention within schools and youth programs as well. And so we don't want to just offer, we want to offer programs, but we want to prevent. And we feel like this is such a hidden topic that people don't talk about that once they get into that situation uh, of human trafficking, it's really hard to get out. So if we don't teach and educate our community on how to identify, maybe they're even being groomed or recruited to be able to, um, they don't even know the signs of what that looks like. We're here to say, hey, let us educate you so that we can prevent that from happening within the community. 
Since we will be talking about human trafficking throughout this episode of Sunday Focus, what is the formal definition of it? Uh, Human trafficking is the use of force, fraud, or coercion to exploit somebody for either sex or labor. When you talk about labor trafficking, you can have harboring, recruiting, or transportation of a person, but force, fraud, and coercion must be proved in either the exchange of money for sex or labor. And also, we worked on legislation in the early years of Calder Freedom that removed force, fraud, or coercion for anybody under the age of 18. So if you're 18 and over, force, fraud, or coercion needs to be proven. If you're under the age of 18, it's just the intent to traffic. So that means if there's a sexual act and there's money exchanged and you're under the age of 18, we're talking about human trafficking. If you are labor and there's the intent to um, exploit you through servant labor servitude, um, you want to make sure that that if you're under the age of 18, force, fraud and coercion does not need to be proven as well. And so understanding that the intent to traffic for anybody under the age of 18, if you're over the age of 18, there's force, fraud and coercion within that element. I think there can be a whole paragraph or even a couple of books about the mission for Call the Freedom. So what is the mission statement for the organization? And also, if you have any pillars to go along with that. Yeah, our our main goal is to restore hope to those that are in hopeless situations. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to reach as many individuals that never thought that they could leave um, those situations. And as we talk about the dynamics that individuals that are lived experience of human trafficking, most of them never thought they would get out of those situations. And that they're one percent of less than one percent of victims ever leave trafficking situations. And mm-hmm. so our job as Call to Freedom is to not only provide housing, basic needs, safety, uh, but it's also to give this a voice because if we don't talk about human trafficking, Uh, Many, many victims don't even know they're being victimized while they're being victimized. And so the more education that we can bring, the more awareness, um, how we can equip our communities, but also first responders to be able to identify victims. There's a healing process that comes for a victim once they understand that I wasn't a part of something. I didn't make this choice. Mm -hmm. And once they realize that they were victimized during this, um, there's something that switches within that person to be able to go, you know what, I can move on from this. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is come alongside and make sure that anybody has uh, been impacted by human trafficking, provides the services, but also the support. We don't have a time frame on which we offer um, services to individuals. And so you can come to us. We've had individuals who are 60 years old that we've offered services. And our youngest that we're serving right now is six years old. And so the age dynamic um, and the dynamic of that human trafficking situation looks really different based upon the victimization. So one person may need housing. The other person may need safety. Some people don't even have clothes or personal identification. And so we really start journeying life with that individual. And our mission is to believe in people. Um, Obviously, we have an assessment process to make sure that they meet criteria for human trafficking, like we talked about the force fraud of coercion. But once they meet that criteria, we will come alongside them in any way to make sure that they know that they have every opportunity to leave that situation and be supported in the process. If you are just listening, we are being joined in the studio right now with the CEO and founder of Call to Freedom, Becky Rasmussen. What's it been like for you being the founder of Call to Freedom? I did do a little bit of reading, I was telling you, and there was a voice in your head that called you to do this based on an experience that you had with the young girl. Can you tell us more about that story? Absolutely. In May of 2015, I was in prayer and I felt a prompting to get back involved with anti-human trafficking. And I didn't know what that looked like. So I did what everybody does is they get on Google and they Google (laughs) human trafficking in South Dakota, right? (laughs) And uh, at that time, uh, a luncheon popped up of an organization called Tapestry International. And they were doing some of this work on a ministry level. So I got connected with them, um, ended up on their board, helped them with fundraising. And then August of 2015, we went to Sturgis, South Dakota. And that trip forever changed my life. 
I had, uh, we were doing outreach and we were handing out materials to anyone that we thought would want to be educated on if you're purchasing a person for sex, it may not be a willing participant. And this is what that situation looks like. And as we were handing out that information, I made eye contact with a, a young girl. She was about 16 years old. And I just felt like I was supposed to go connect with her. So I walked right up to her and I said, I'm sorry if this is odd, but my name is Becky. What's your name? And she said, my name is Marissa. And I had about a 10 minute conversation with a young girl who was very scared, fearful, wouldn't make a lot of eye contact with me. And her last words to me were, you have no idea what kind of day I've had. You have no idea. And she walked away from me. Mm. The next day, there was a group called Free International that was actually doing what they call search and rescue. And so what they would do is actually do a four to five state radius of missing kids and they would go to events. So they've been to Super Bowl, PGA. This year, um, that year, they were in Sturgis, South Dakota, Mm. doing what they called a search and rescue. What they started to realize when they would do missing kids is a lot of the kids that were missing because one in six youth that are homeless fall into human trafficking situations. And they started to realize that, gosh, it's not just missing kids that we're identifying. These kids are in trafficking situations, but maybe on the missing list. He hands me a book as he's talking about what do we do? And here we are. And something just said, look for the girl that you met the day before. And I start flipping through the book and there's Marissa's picture. What I know about Marissa is that she, so this was August of 2015. Mm -hmm. She was found in October of 2014 and she went missing again, May of 2015. And I started asking the questions, you know, how do you find somebody who was missing and how do they go missing again? Mm-hmm. How, do, how do you lose kids like that? And they began to tell me that there were only 298 beds at that time for human trafficking survivors and that these groups would talk to each other and re-recruit. And based on what they knew about Marissa, they suspected that she had been recruited into a trafficking ring and that had been why she had been found and went missing again. I didn't know what to do with that. And I walked back and I, the woman who was uh, the executive director of Tapestry International at the time said, I feel like I'm supposed to transition this work to you. And I said, say what? Like at this point in time <laughs> in my life, I was a single mom. Mm-hmm. I had a job. Um, there wasn't a lot of financial support for this work because nobody really talked about it. Mm-hmm. And it's so new. But I really felt like it was a call. I prayed. And so I stepped out in faith and founded Call to Freedom in January of 2016 and got our 501c3, opened our first office March of 2016. And the home that now houses women and children together is called Marissa's House in honor of the young girl that I met in Sturgis, South Dakota. That's amazing. And to have this great organization and Marissa's House be the inspiration behind it, that's powerful. In fact, that gets people wanting to talk about this more because human trafficking, it is a big deal. Now, before you met Marissa and did your work, were you familiar with human trafficking or what's something that you learned from it? Yeah. You know, I had had interaction with cases doing outreach on a pastoral side. I had worked for a nonprofit and Volunteers of America Dakotas for years and and worked with individuals within Mm -hmm. that program and helping them share their voice. And through all those positions, I never realized how many people I came in contact with that were in situations that I didn't identify at that time. So as I learned about what human trafficking looked like, I was able to navigate some of those clients on outreach in a a much more efficient way, understanding their trauma. So I can't say that I was probably the most educated and gifted to Mm -hmm. step into the call that I'm in today. And I've learned so much over the last eight years of how to do this and do it well. I think the key to why Call to Freedom is that the level of services they are is because we listen to survivors. 
our programming is really led by survivor input. There aren't a lot of program models out there for human trafficking recovery because it's such a new topic. It was only put into state federal legislation um, in early 2000. Mm -hmm. And so we are just beginning to talk about human trafficking. The programs out there haven't really defined an effective model. And so we really look to survivors in the journey of a survivor. And if something didn't work really well, we said, how could we change that to do it better? And so we engage survivors in our program development. We actually have a survivor on staff who oversee and vets all of our programming. I'm here to tell you, Marissa's house just got certified on a national level. Mm. We are one of 2% in the nation that provides services to human trafficking victims and their children. And we are at a standard best practice standard, which I call a gold level and a blue <laughs> level, level of certification. And we're in top three in the nation of what we're doing. And, and that is the power of the survivor's voice to be able to teach you how to journey and what they need and listening to their voice to be able to develop programming that really meets um, all the diverse needs of a, an individual impacted by human trafficking. It, if anything, too, I was just thinking Marissa's story also shows that Human trafficking does happen in South Dakota. Can you share some statistics about human trafficking in South Dakota and even in the nation? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the key statistics is less than 1% of victims are ever identified. Mm -hmm. That's why education for first responders, being in the emergency departments of hospital, being our law enforcement, being um, those that are in youth programs or providing in child protection services, all of those people are on the front lines to help identify victims of human trafficking. So education within those circles is extremely important. Here in South Dakota, we have uh, three of the poorest uh, counties in the United States located here in South Dakota. Um, and those are our reservations. Right now, we actually, since 2017 to 2022, we have actually seen a 50% increase in homelessness within South Dakota. Wow. And so when we see stats like that, where we have vulnerabilities within our state for poverty levels, but also homeless levels, and also we have 29 and 90 going through our communities, which we call transit trafficking. They're mm -hmm. going from different communities through our communities, and they love isolation. If they can isolate a victim, that's why rural communities are a great place for this to prosper. That's why our tribal nation is a great place for, for trafficking to prosper is because it remains hidden. And because of those vulnerabilities, you can find people who need to meet their basic needs. I need somebody to, you know, money to provide housing, heat. And when I can't do that without, you know, being able to provide for myself, these traffickers will identify vulnerable populations. They will introduce and groom them to to sell even their own children. And one of the most common that we see in the state of South Dakota is what we call familial trafficking. And that is actually parents, aunts, and uncles selling their own children to meet their basic needs. Could be a drug habit. Um, it could be just to pay the heat bill, to get a pack of beer. I mean, we've seen every scenario within our South Dakota and within our tribal nations, but we serve 38% Native American and the rest are a diverse of, of Caucasian. So this isn't just one population, but because of those dynamics, we have a lot of uh, increase that we're seeing as well within those human trafficking situations. I think there was also a stat that I saw that claims, and you mentioned this earlier too, that people don't even realize that human trafficking exists in their area. They just kind of ignore, pretend like it's not even there. Do you think it shows that people tend to turn away from the situation? We see lots of different responses, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, we see people that just don't want to believe that this happens. They don't want to hear it. They want to maybe live in a bubble of a perfect world. But the reality is, is this is the second largest criminal activity and it's growing at a rate. If we don't talk about it, it's kind of be like guns. You know, we're guns. We didn't talk about guns. We didn't talk about drugs. Mm -hmm. Now what we see on fentanyl coming through our borders in, and now we have specialized units addressing the drugs, right? Mm -hmm. 
well, where are you going to go if you're an illegal activity? <laughs> you're going to yeah. go where people aren't talking about it. And let me tell you, now that we have the internet, it's easy to find victims and, and to target and groom victims throughout, throughout social media, throughout different ways, through the gaming on the internet. Because you can pr be somebody that's fake. You can create a fake profile mm -hmm. and you can say you're somebody and you can look at that person's Facebook page or that Instagram page and go, wow, their mom isn't involved in their life. Their dad's not involved in their life. I know what their vulnerability is. I'm going to become the answer to that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And their whole point is they'll target you. They will groom you. They will isolate you and they will draw you to them. And, and by the time the parents get involved, they don't even know what's happened because these people are so good at what they do. And what we've seen on the internet is if um, it, the dynamic of trafficking is you have a demand, which is a buyer. And you have a trafficker who we call the business person. And if that demand wants a young boy that's age 11 to 14, that trafficker who the business person is going to go on to social media pages. He's going to go where he can connect with individuals that he can make money off of. And he's going to, he or she is going to build a relationship with that individual with the intent to draw them into trafficking or exploitation situations. And what we've seen increase since 2021 is a substantial increase in sextortion, which is the exchange of uh, pictures, illicit pictures, nudie pictures, or videos of young kids. And so they will go on and they will create these, they being the perpetrators will create fake profiles. They'll say, I'm a modelish type girl. Um, I really have an interest in you. You're really great. Um, I think I can make a connection with you. They build this relationship and they'll take time to build the relationship. Yeah. Sometimes it isn't just within two hours. Sometimes it's weeks that we've had where they've been groomed by their perpetrator. And once they feel like they have built this relationship or trust, then they'll say, let me in introduce you to another site. And it'll be an encrypted site where they actually go on and then they begin to exchange pictures or videos. Yeah. And then they begin to blackmail these young kids. And what we've seen in this increase from 11 to 14, especially with young boys, because we don't talk about boys. Yeah. We don't have a lot of services for young boys. We've created a community that says, boys, don't talk about it. Just, you know, buck up and, yeah. and move on with life. And we haven't created safe places for our kids to have the conversation. If something like this happens, we've seen an increase of suicides. And, and what I'm saying to our community is go get educated, go learn what this looks like, because I'm telling you those perpetrators are educating themselves on how to do this better. And as a community, the best thing that we can do is get educated, understand what our kids are viewing on social media, on gaming sites, who they're connecting with. So we don't fall into this exploitation, sextortion or human trafficking situation. If you were just listening, Becky Rasmussen with Call the Freedom, she is on with us in the studio talking about the organization and just ways to stay educated with this very important topic. Now, let's talk about those education options for Call the Freedom. What are some programs that you guys offer? Absolutely. We offer free training to anybody who wants it. So if you are a school or you consider yourself a first responder, we have actually a survivor on staff who does our first responder trainings. And so it's from a lived experience perspective. And she would be more than happy to come to your business or community to talk about how to better identify victims of trafficking. We also have prevention trainers. Um, we have a Spanish speaking bilingual where they're able to go out and do what we call the speak up curriculum and also the set me free, both evidence-based curriculums that we've been educated on, vetted, and we're able to go into schools. Um, we go into youth programs. We go into youth residential programs. We are passionate about getting the message out. And so you can um, go to calltofreedom.org and you can request a training of any type and we'll come to you. If you cannot request a training, you're not in the area, we do have an event on July 18th, what we call our informative luncheon. And we actually spend an hour and a half together where we talk about what we do as an organization, but also what does this look like? And we have about four scenarios of trafficking from lived experience from people that we've served that have given us the 
thumbs up to be able to use those stories to teach and educate our community. And so that is a free uh, informational luncheon. You can go to calderfreedom.org under events and you can sign up for that and we'll let you know where the location is as well as a Zoom option to be able to Zoom into that. And then on July 22nd, we will have an event called Hidden in Plain Sight and we actually rent out the state theater and we Mm. hold this event and we actually bring in survivors of human trafficking to share their lived, not only their lived experience, but their experience working in the field of anti-human trafficking game changer. When you start hearing from people that have experienced and, and the horrific details that they have survived, but also what they're doing in the fight to make a difference, It's life-changing. It's one of our best events. And then October 9th, we have uh, what we call our community breakfast. And that is a fundraising event. And it's open. It's it's free to the community. But we do do an ask. um, And we do share survivors lived experience and who we've served at that as well as well as community members coming together saying why they're involved in the fight. And we would love to have you at any of those events here in 2024. And this is the time to get educated at those events or even visit calltofreedom.org for more information about getting educated and recognizing sex trafficking victims. I do have a little quick story that I witnessed in Sioux Falls. I want to say it was about a year ago now. And I was picking up my husband from the airport. And as we were driving, I was paying attention to what he was saying. But I noticed there was a guy on a motorcycle and there was this girl walking across the street. The guy pulls over into this parking lot. The girl follows him into that parking lot. Nothing ended up happening out of it. He just drove away. But I wonder still to this day if they were finding a place to meet up or if this was going to be a victim of sex trafficking. And I was having my phone in my hand as I was driving. I should not have been doing that, but I was about ready to call the the police, to call 911. And that still kind of haunts me to this day, almost a year later, that something like that happened right here in Sioux Falls. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it happens that quickly mm-hmm. um, in front of people's eyes. I don't know if that was trafficking or not. Yeah. But there is a grooming process that happens they'll make connection, you know, that could be a connecting point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I always say to people, follow your gut. If you feel like something's off, you're probably right. Um, Could it be trafficking? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Could it be an exploitation situation? Possibly. Could it be some other type of victimization? Possibly. But I think, you know, and working with local PD, it's it's always um, report, report. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's our key. I, I think sometimes, too, is if we report, we think, oh, that wasn't a big deal. But they are the ones that are actually formulating cases. Mm-hmm. So you never know. Your call might be that last piece of information they need or that last connecting point Or it may be a missing kid that you don't even know that's on the missing kid radar. And so we always say report. And I think that's the key. And and we've worked with the attorney general's office. We've streamlined those processes across the state to be able to share information because trafficking goes through communities. It doesn't always happen in one community. So they may be coming from West River to Sioux Falls Mm -hmm. on their way to, you know, somewhere and maybe in Chicago. We've had where these lines go through. And so how do we share? share information at each of those points so that we're building cases. And so the attorney general's office, actually South Dakota attorney general's uh, website under law enforcement resources and human trafficking report form is open to our community now. And if you are a community member and you see something based on what you've heard about human trafficking Mm -hmm. or other victimization, you can go to their site and actually fill out a form so that they have that information. It can be anonymous. It can be you want to share your name. um, But I would say get as many details as you can to report. And then that information will be distributed to the right law enforcement across the state. But they're collecting that information so they can build cases across the state as well. And that's really important to really effectively prosecuting cases within the state of South Dakota. If anybody has any more questions, say that website one more time and even a phone number that they can call to. Call to freedom.org. If you want to report anything as well, it's 1-888-373-373. 
888-7888. And that is to report anything that you see as well as going to the South Dakota Attorney General site. And 605-261-1880 is called a freedom's number as well. Becky Rasmussen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Sunday Focus is a public affairs program of Results Radio, Town Square Media, Sioux Falls.